I do have to apologize. I did not realize how far I was behind grading. I thought I was a little more caught up, and I was appalled when I saw how far behind I was. So I did grade one thing. I, my aim is to get a few things done uh, this week and be pretty much on, on uh, track. My goal is typically to have everything graded within a week of, um, of uh, the, the original due date. Um, this year, that's kind of been like the Cleveland Browns having the goal of winning every football game. You know, it, it, it <laughs> doesn't really happen that often. But I am thinking, because I had a few extra additional things on my plate at the beginning of the semester, I'm hoping I'll be able to catch up and do better. Plus, I my laptop drowned. Um, literally, yes. <laughs> uh, so um, I, I hope to get catch up, and I apologize for it. One thing I, I did notice, and, and a few people had this, and I don't remember if I put a note on everyone's or a general note or what, but there's a little quirky thing with the rock, paper, and scissors that if you did not use a button, if you did not use a button, You have rock, paper, and scissors, let's say, and you have a drop down. If you did not use a button there and you had an auto post back with this, there's a tiny problem. Can anyone anticipate what that tiny problem would be? This one's tricky, but it's a good, it's a it's a, it's a good problem to think through, I think. Because it's really important, sort of, to understand how these things work. Yes. Um, say if you were to select rock and yes. then it, um, then you try to select rock again. Is that the issue? Exactly. Yeah, so, so yeah. what? What? What is the issue there? It wouldn't generate a new random. Thing yeah. Because yeah, the problem is, is if you picked rock the first time, it would go and do its thing and give you the results. That event. The auto postback only fires off when the value of the drop down changes. So therefore, if you wanted rock again, um, you were kind of stuck for the user. You'd either have to pick something else or go back to the dummy selection, get the validation error and then go back to it, or, or not. And, and in that case, the better thing to do would be to have the button. All right. Uh, to have a button there that says go ahead and do it. That way, and again, like what I did when I was, probably the only reason I found this out is what I do when I test this one a lot of times is I'll just leave it on rock and just hit the button over and over and over again and to make sure that it goes through all the possible scenarios. Then I'll pick another one and do that for it and all that. So that's really the only way I noticed that. Uh, but it's subtle, I have to admit. And I don't think I deducted for it. If I did, let me know. Because uh, I didn't want to deduct for it. I decided that that's not <coughs> deduct worthy. And uh, I might have put a note uh, on it or not. I don't remember. I might have put a note on individual ones, or I might have just made a group announcement. I don't really remember. I guess I could look it up. But... It was a group announcement. Okay. Group announcement. All right. Cool. All right. So what we were working on this time was... something like this, where we have our, let's draw the database tables first. We have a topping table that has a topping ID, um, a name, a description. I might not be getting these columns right, and I think calories. We then have a specialty pizza table. That has a specialty pizza ID and a name and maybe some other columns. Now the relationship between these is many to many. And again, in order to do that, you have to look going both directions. That's a mistake I see some students make as they look in one direction and say, well, especially pizza can have many toppings. All right, so then it's a one-to-many relationship. Well, you only looked at it in one direction. You have to look in the other direction. Especially pizza can have many toppings associated with it, right? A Hawaiian pizza can have pineapple and uh, bacon or ham or whatever. A, you have to look the other way, though. 
A topping can be on how many specialty pizzas. A topping can also be on many specialty pizzas. Therefore, what you have is a many-to-many -many relationship. And you can draw it like this. That's typically the way that I would draw it. All right. Another way you could draw it would be like this. Mm, yeah, good point. All right. Um, and a couple things to remember. First of all, it doesn't matter how many the many is. So you might say, for example, like, well, no pizza is ever going to have more than five toppings on it. All right? It doesn't matter. If it's more than one, it's many. We only think in terms of zero, that there's no relationship between two tables, one or many. So if it's more than one, it's many. So we don't worry about the exact number of it. Uh. Now, one thing about many-to-many -many relationships is they can't stand. You can draw them in a design, but you can't actually implement them in a database. So you have to resolve them. All right? You have to resolve them one way or another. And really, actually I shouldn't say one way or another. You have to resolve them, and there's one way to do it. All right? Uh, there's some slight variations in the manner in which you do it, but basically there's only one way. And that's, what, that's by creating what's called an intersecting entity or an intersecting table. And what the table does is it matches up rows in this table with rows in this table. So for every specialty pizza, there'll be a row in the intersecting table for every topping that it has. And for every topping, there'll be a row in the table for every specialty pizza that's on it. So the intersecting entity in this, in this case would look like this. Typically, you give it the name of the two tables. So specialty pizza, topping. And one way to do it would be to have the two primary keys of the related tables together as a primary key in this table. The fact that they're the primary key in this table means that that combination can only be in there once, which is fine. You know, you're just going to say that, hey, there's pepperoni on the meat lover's pizza. You wouldn't have pepperoni twice for a meat lover's pizza. Right. All right. Okay. You can do this other ways. You could give this its own ID under different situations. We'll probably encounter something like that at some point, but for now... I'm not going to worry about it. And these, of course, will be foreign keys. It's important to enforce these as foreign keys because that gives you the referential integrity. What do I mean by referential integrity? It means that you can't have something in this table that doesn't point to a valid specialty pizza and a valid topping. You just can't do it. No. By hook or by crook, as they say. So it doesn't matter what program you write to do this. And that's one of the reasons we try to implement as many constraints as possible on the database level. Because the database is the guardian of the data. All right? Um, any rules that are declared on the database level will be enforced no matter what. So it doesn't matter. You could have many applications writing to that database. You could have a mobile app. You could have a web app. You could have a desktop app. All of those applications could be writing to the same database. But you know what? It doesn't matter what application is writing them. You can't put data in a database that violates referential integrity. So you could not put a, speci uh, a, 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 a bogus specialty pizza ID number in that table. No. If it's declared as a foreign key. You simply can't do it. No. All right? You'll get an error. Likewise with the unique rule of a primary key and all those other rules. You only have to get those validation rules once. You don't have to worry about every single programmer that writes it to understand them and to get them right. Because the database will make sure everything's right. Okay. So that's the table. Uh, the table structure that we have for this part of the example. 
What our task was last time was to create a page that looks like this. We will pick the specialty pizza we want in a drop down. I'm going to move this over a little bit because I don't want to erase the tables. No. We're going to pick the specialty pizza that we want in this drop down. And we're then going to get a list of the toppings for that pizza. All right? So, a couple things that's different about this than the first thing that we did. All right? First of all, we have two different visual components here. We have a drop-down list, and we have a grid view. Last time, we only had a grid view. All right? Um, <clears throat> Remember that we can tie our SQL data source to, to many different kinds of visual, um, visual uh, interfaces. So we have a drop-down list and we have a grid view. We can, again, we can bind it to all sorts of things. So that's a little different than we've done before. All right, that's actually not that hard. We'll review it and, uh, again, um, that's just... That's just a way of demonstrating that we can represent visually the data that we pull from the database a variety of different ways. All right? Now, the other thing that's different about this is this will require two SQL data sources. And the way, if you're not sure if it's one or two SQL data sources, the best way to do it, in my mind, is to verbally describe what the contents of each of those are going to be. And if it is like the same words that describe it, then it's probably the same data source. But if it's different words that describe it, it's a different data source. In this case, what do I want in here? I want a list of all the specialty pizzas. So this is all specialty pizzas. This is a list of toppings for the selected specialty pizza. All right? Those are not the same thing. One is a list of pizzas, one is a list of toppings. All right? One is all the specialty pizzas, one is the toppings for the specialty pizza that we selected. So those are two different things altogether. So we have two different SQL data sources. Now this data source is going to be very straightforward. It's essentially just going to select everything, or maybe the specialty pizza ID and the specialty pizza name from specialty pizza order by name, by specialty pizza name. Um, what does our select statement look like? Again, it starts with the word select. All our queries are going to start with the word select. So. Thursday, if I come in here and say we're writing a query, <coughs> last shells. what do we put in for the query? Yell out the word select, select. And you'll get, exactly. And you'll get credit for that much of it, and then someone else can figure out the rest of it. All right, so all our queries start with the word select. We then have a list of the columns that we want. All right, in this case, we want the specialty ID and the specialty pizza name. Now remember that a drop-down has two pieces to it. Uh. It has the pieces that, uh, it has the, the thing that we see, that the user sees, and it has something behind the scene that the script is going to see. Typically, we're going to want the name or the description or something like that displaying in the drop-down, but behind the scenes, we want typically the primary key. So no matter, even if you don't see the primary key being displayed, you will almost always select the primary key as one of the columns. So there we're just seeing the specialty pizza name, but behind the scenes of that drop-down, we need the ID because we need the ID to do the second query. All right? The from clause is the tables that we're using to get that. So if we used any table, any other table, anywhere else in this select statement, we would put it in the from clause. The order by clause you should not ignore. All right? You should not assume that the data in a 
database table is in any order at all. All right. I know in Access, for example, is going to be in primary key order if you do a select without an order by. Uh, I believe it is. I believe it is all the time. But you should make that assumption because other databases can be implemented in other manners. Um, so make no assumption about the sequence of the data in the database table. And typically we want some rhyme or reason to these things, so pretty much always put an order by clause um, on, on your SQL statement. All right? And that way it will, it will put it in some order that will be apparent. It probably also should be an order that makes sense to the user, too. Um, and if you don't have a better idea, alphabetical order is a great example. It is. That's not the only way that you could have a, an order that makes sense. For example, many of you have probably seen on websites um, that maybe are predominantly in the United States, but not exclusively. It will have a list of countries that are in alphabetical order, but it might have, you know, United States, Canada, and Mexico at the top. Because those are the typical, this, that's where most of the users come from. Or maybe, um, you know, maybe the, the you know, if you, if you had an idea of what pizzas were ordered most often, maybe you would put those uh, in a certain order or something like that. So alphabetical order isn't the only order, but if you don't have a better idea, then alphabetical order is, is a good way uh, to, to go. All right. So what's the select statement from this one going to look like? Well, how many tables do we need? in this select statement. Uh, this is going to show all the toppings for the selected pizza. <coughs> okay. This is going to be a number that's between 1 and 3, all right? Inclusively, right? Because if it was zero tables, I don't even know how that would work. It would have to be magic. There's only three tables on the board, so it can't be four tables. So it has to be one, two, or three tables. One table? Two. Two? Two. I feel like I'm in an auction here. Two or three would be acceptable, but I'm going to go with two, simply because that will make it a little simpler. You could include all three of these, but you really don't need to. You only need to include two tables. And what two tables do we need to include? We want to show the toppings for the selected Specialty pizza. Yes, we do. Yeah. One thing we need is we need this table. Because this is going to give us an ID number, a specialty pizza ID number. And we're going to use that to query this table to find the toppings that are associated with that pizza. So we're going to access this table. But this table is going to give us a topping ID. We don't want to see just a list of topping IDs, right? That this pizza has topping 4, 8, and 7 on it. Well, what are 4, 8, and 7? No one has any idea. So therefore, we want to say it has pepperoni, mushrooms, and sausage on it. So therefore, we need a topping name. So we need this table as well. So we could include this table in the mix, but we really don't need it. We just need to know all the toppings for a given specialty pizza. Well, what table contains a list of the toppings for a specialty pizza? This table. So this table will give us the toppings that we want. This table will give us uh, the name of the topping and any other information that we, we, we might want. So what do we want to display here? So. Okay, I'll test. How do we start this query? Select. Select, thank you. Select. What do we want to show in this grid view? What columns do we want to show? Topic name. Well, we definitely want to show the topic name. Yeah, there is that. Topic name. Do we want to show anything else? Description of the topping? Yeah, sure.
Anything else? Calories. Yeah, maybe the calories. Yeah, calories can't hurt. Anything else? This would probably work, but I always include the primary key in there too, just in case you might use it. You might not show it, right? Because your customer doesn't really care what the ID number is. The ID number is just for the database purposes. It doesn't really mean anything to them, all right? But there might be some point where you need that. So I'm going to pull these columns from the table. All right. Now, what tables are we going to pull this from? Topping. Topping. What other table are we going to use in this? Pardon me? We're also going to use that. All right. So. Don't be confused that all these columns come from the topping table. We still have to use the specialty pizza topping uh, table. Um, we're not selecting any columns from it. We're not going to display any columns from it, but we need to use it. Why do we need to use it? We need to use it to find all the toppings for a given pizza. All right? Now, Anytime you have more than two tables, the odds are overwhelming that you need a where clause. All right? And I'll show you what happens if you don't get it. There's a real easy, if you see this, you know you probably messed up the where clause when we, when we actually go and implement this in, in, in the database. But we need a where clause. One thing we need for a WHERE clause is WHERE clauses can serve two purposes. WHERE clauses can be used to join tables together, to link them, to say how they're related to each other. That's one thing that a WHERE clause can be used for. The other thing that a WHERE clause can be used for is to filter out the stuff that we need. All right? In this case, we're going to use the WHERE clause for both purposes. All right? We're going to link those two tables together because anytime you have more than one table, you need to link them together. It doesn't matter the fact that you've declared a foreign key that says that the topping ID in one table matches the topping ID in the other table. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that those are called the same names. You still, when you define a select statement, have to define how those are linked together. So, and, and why is that? Just flexibility. Maybe there's sometimes that you would want to do it some other way. Who knows? But you have to explicitly say how those columns are linked together. So we need to specify how these columns are, or how these tables are linked together. So how is the topping ID table Topping table matches the specialty pizza topping table. Not all topping IDs are in the topping table. Not, there's, there's probably more topping IDs in the topping table than there are in the specialty pizza topping table. <clears throat> maybe, maybe not. How would I link those together? In other words, if I have a top, if I know that this this table has topping ID 1. How do I find out the topping that is topping ID 1? How would I find that out? You link it together using topping ID. So, in other words, when the topping ID, these two things match up, when the topping ID matches the topping ID. Right. Now I'm going to write this down, but I'm going to leave some space because this is not right. All right? And I think you'll see what's not right in a second. What looks weird about that? Where topping ID equals topping ID? Huh? 
Yeah, go ahead. You have to put down which table it belongs to. Exactly. When more than one table is involved, if, if the two tables have columns that have the same name, which these are going to, right, because there's foreign keys, and we're naming them that way on purpose to make it obvious to us, we have to specify the table name in addition to the column name. All right? I'm going to look at a class list real quick. I hope there's two people in here that have the same name. Excuse me. Can you pretend for a minute that your name is Garrett? Sure. Okay. <laughs> hey, Garrett, raise your hand. Oh, two people named Garrett. Which one did I want to raise their hand? Well, yeah, because you're really Garrett, all right? <laughs> but, uh, hey, Nick, raise your hand. Okay. If there's only one person in the room that has a name, all I need to do is give the first name, and that's enough to identify them. There's two people in the room that have the same name, all right? I probably need to give more information, and for the purpose of this, let's assume your last name is Jones, all right? So, Garrett Sermon, raise your hand. Ah, we don't have the ambiguity anymore. We've given the full name of the person. Now again, I know that there could be two Garrett Sermons in the room because, of, you know, but whatever, you get the idea. With database tables, though, all right, it's the same thing. If within the tables that you're picking from, if the name of the column only exists in one of the tables, you can just give the column name. True. Like topping name is only in the toppings table. So I can just say toppings name. There's no ambiguity about which column I want. Same thing with topping description, topping calories. But what about topping ID? That's in both tables. So I need to fully qualify the name. How do you fully qualify it? You put the name of the table before it. So topping dot topping ID equals specialty pizza. Topping dot topping ID. True. And likewise up here. I also mentioned topping ID up here, so I'd have to do that there. Doesn't really matter which one I pick because they're equal. But I do have to qualify which one I want. Now, you can always use the full name, right? Even though there's only one Nick in here, I could say, Nick Malakar, raise your hand. And that's going to work. All right? But you have to use both the first name and last name, the table name and column name, if there's more than one. So I could say toppings dot topping name and so on. All right? While we're here, it probably would pay to say that if your database contains, if your database either column name or table name contains a space, you put square brackets around it. I, ne I never embed spaces in the column names. It's just a pain, all right? It is. But if you were going to say topping space name for this to work, you need to include these in brackets. The other thing is if you happen to stumble into a database reserved word, um, let's say you were writing some kind of email set, uh, um, log and there was a from column in your database. Well, that's a reserved word, right? That means something in a select statement. If you did this, it would recognize it as a column name. So any shady column names or table names put the square brackets around. 
By shady, I mean things that could be misinterpreted. Yes? The tapping name, are you talking about the name of the table or like each individual? Uh, this would be either. Like if I, if I called, like in this table, I called the column topping name. But if I did topping space name, it would be that. Same thing here, though, with specialty pizza. If I called the table specialty pizza with a space in it, then when I wrote a select statement, I put it in square brackets. So for either column names or table names, if there is a, an embedded space or maybe it's a database reserve word or something like that, then I would include them in square brackets. Now, that's one half of the WHERE clause. Keep in mind, there's only one WHERE clause. A lot of times people think, well, I want to add a second WHERE clause. No, you're adding a second part to the WHERE clause. Only one WHERE clause. And in this case, what do we want to do? We want to filter, because we don't want to show every topping for every specialty pizza. We just want to show the toppings for this specialty pizza. Therefore, I need a WHERE clause to filter that out. So I will add to this and specially pizza ID equals what? All right. What's going to go in specially pizza ID going to equal what? ID that you're searching for? Yeah, whatever ID I'm searching for, right? In other words, if I'm searching for Hawaiian pizzas, it'll be whatever the ID of Hawaiian pizza is. If I'm searching for meat lovers pizza, it'll be whatever that ID is. So I don't know when I write the SQL statement the value of that. That's going to happen at runtime. That's going to happen when the user does what? When the user selects a value up here. So the user selecting a value here is what's going to fill in that blank. All right? So we can't say what that value is right now. So we have to say that's going to get filled in at runtime. That, in other words, is a parameter. Oftentimes you'll see this described as a parameterized query. In other words, it's a query, but it's a query that you have to give it something for it to do its job. So this is a form of the query, and all of this is going to be the same no matter what pizza we're looking at. The different piece is going to be this little number here. We're going to plug in the ID of the pizza that we want. Well, where do we get the ID of the pizza that we want? From this drop-down. Because remember, oh, you thought I accidentally did that. We query the ID, and that ID is stored behind the scenes in that drop-down. So, how do we represent a parameter? We do it with a question mark. A question mark means this gets filled in later at runtime. This value is going to come from somewhere. All right? Now, there's several places where it could come from. In this example, it's going to come from the drop down. All right? So, the specific specialty pizza that we want is going to come from somewhere. All right? So, that's it. I probably would do an order by topping name. I don't have enough space to write it on there, but based on what I said before, um, that's probably what I would do. Now, there's other ways to join a table, and we'll look at them later. Right. This is sort of an old school way of joining tables with the where clause. <coughs> there's sort of a, a newer way. This is like the way that I learned way back uh, when I learned this. So it's sort of what I go back to. Really doesn't, doesn't make a huge amount of difference, but I do want you to see both ways. Again, if for no other reason, so that if you see these, if you see this written somewhere, you'll, you'll understand what it is. This way, in my mind, is simpler. Simpler syntax for people to learn, and so on. So that's, that's the approach that I'm going to take. All right, let's pick up where we left off last time. Now, where we left off last time, if I recall correctly, is we did the drop down, but we didn't do anything with the second query or uh, grid view. So let's pick up there. Yes.
All right, I want to remind you how to open this, because I still see occasionally students that have that open it incorrectly. We're going to open up Visual Studio. Okay, good. <clears throat> I'm going to go to File, Open, Website, and I'm going to find the file that has the web config. I'm going to find the folder that has the web config file in it, and that's this one. I'm going to open it up. Okay. <clears throat> this is the one that we were looking at, so I'm going to set this to the start page. Right. And if I run this, I get a page that has a drop down. All right, there's our drop down. That comes from the database. That's not hard coded. So if I go in now, and add a specialty pizza here, all right, it's going to immediately shut. In fact, let's go and do that. I'm going to go in the database, which again, where is the database stored? It's in a folder called app underscore data. If it's an access or, or other file-based database system. If I go into specialty pizza, I could add a veggie pizza here. And veggie pizza will have basil mushrooms and tofu pepperoni. So three, four, and six. So, immediately, when I click refresh, it's not there now, right? Remember, when does the database get hit and this dropdown gets formed? When the server gets hit. So, I pulled this page up before I went into the database. So, when I come back, the new pizza isn't going to be listed on there. However, the next time someone accesses this page, if I hit refresh, now the pizza is on the list. Okay, let's spend a minute looking at this page, the specialty page. I have a SQL data source. And connects using my pizza connection string. So I only have one connection string for, per database. So if we only have one database, we should only have one connection string. Where do these live? Um, in the web config file? Yeah, the web config. All right. If I look and do a next, the SQL statement is select specialty pizza ID, select uh, specialty pizza name from specialty pizza, order by specialty pizza name. I can test it. It shows me a list of the pizzas. I'm in business. Now, the drop-down has a couple things. First of all, choose data source. Remember, our page could have a bunch of data sources. We have to say which one. So I said that, which one? SQL data source one. I then also have to define for a drop-down list two things. What the user is going to see and what the value for each option is going to be. Remember, an option in a drop-down and HTML consists of two parts. It consists of what the user is going to see. That's the inner HTML of the option tag. And it also consists of a value. And that's the value that sort of exists behind the scenes that scripts are going to use. So the data field I want to display is especially pizza name. right? Because if I displayed the ID, that wouldn't make any sense. You know, what is pizza, especially pizza four? All right, what is especially pizza three? All right, no one knows. 
Our customers certainly wouldn't know. But behind the scenes, for example, when I go and do my query, all right, I am going to need the actual ID of the specialty pizza. So that is defined as the value of the drop-down list. All right. I'm going to do one other thing, and that is I'm going to add a button. Right. If I didn't add a button, what would I have to do to make it submit? Have to change that to auto post back. Exactly. Yeah. That, All right. That might work. So now. Remember we said we have a second SQL data source, right? Because when I verbally describe the two pieces of data on this page, I get a different explanation. The top one is a list of all the specialty pizzas. The bottom one is the specialty pizzas, oh, I'm sorry, it's the toppings for the given specialty pizza. So, I'm going to go in here, I'm going to create a grid view. I'm going to create a SQL data source, configure data source, okay. Okay. clearly it's not. Yeah. I did put in a requisition for either a new computer or an extra squirrel to get the speed up on this one. Maybe if there's two squirrels running around in the treadmill. Yes? Uh, just really quick, before getting to that, so you hit, you hit that little arrow at the top, right? Uh -huh. And then you went to the choose data source drop down? Um, did or what did I, I, I clicked, I, I went, you, you could do this a couple different ways, but I went to the data source clicked the little arrow, and said configure data source. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, okay, cool. All right. And then... Well, I'm going to kill it then. Let's see what we have. This could be an interesting second half of the lecture. If the computer doesn't work, I'll have to do an interpretive dance or something to show you how this works. So file, open, website, pizza. Specialty pizza. I'm going to set that as a start. And we'll try this again. I'm going to drag a grid view and a SQL data source. One thing that I have to admit, I'm not perfect about is it probably is a good idea to give these meaningful names other than SQL data source 1, 2, 3, and so forth. So I'm going to call this one SQL data source toppings, and I'll call the grid view grid toppings. These little things that take like 10 seconds to do, you think, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Not that big of a deal when you uh, until you come back, you know, six months later, and you're looking at a page that has five C uh, SQL data sources on it, and you're trying to remember, well, which one is SQL data source one again, and and so on. So, spend the time to give things meaningful names. All right, I'm going to go in, click the little arrow, configure data source. Which data source do I want to use? I want to use a piece of connection string. Remember, I'm only going to create a new connection the very first time I do this. 
all right? Because the whole idea is I want everything pointing to the one connection string. I don't want multiple connection strings. So the very first time I connect to the database, I will put the connection string to find the connection string, and then I will use that one everywhere else in this application. All right, next. All right, I'm going to go in, and I'm going to write specify a custom SQL statement. And I'm going to go and I'm going to type it into Word and paste it into here. All right, simply because... Well, let's do Notepad plus plus. Simply because I want to make it easier to see. So select. I'm going to go and look in Access to get my column's name right. Toppings ID, topping name, description, calories. One nice thing is I can, doesn't matter the case that they were defined in. You can also format it, apply some formatting to this if you want. I know a lot of people like to write their select statements like this, simply because it's easier to read. These little things that you do to make it easier to read are a big deal. All right, again, especially when you come back later. From, where we list the names of the tables. So from, Toppings. toppings and specialty pizza topping. Where toppings. dot topping ID, and I should put that up here as well, equals specialty pizza topping. dot toppings ID. And toppings ID equals question mark. All right. If we know what pizza, we'll know what to put in there. All right. But yes. Is it toppings ID equals question mark? Or is it special? You're absolutely right, especially pizza ID. Because we want to pick all the toppings for the specialty pizza. ID equals question mark. And for good measure, we could put an order by clause in here. And I probably want to order by topping name. So this is my select. I'm going to pop it in here. No, not really. You, you can. Okay. I don't think it really cares about that. I'm going to go in here, copy this, paste it in here. Next. All right. Important screen. 
This is a new screen. For every question mark that we put in there, we have to say where the data is going to come from. All right? We have to supply it with a value, and we have to tell where to get the value from. In other words, I put a question mark that says, hey, at runtime, we're going to put in an actual ID here. Well, okay, where's that ID coming from? I have a choice of a number of places it can come from. All right? This is coming from a control. All right? It specifically is coming from the drop-down. All right? So it's coming from a control. What control is it coming from? Well, there's only two controls on the page, the drop-down list and the grid. The grid doesn't really make any sense. It's coming from the drop-down list. So it will take the value, let me expand that, it will take the selected value from that drop-down list and use it as the value for that parameter. So that's where it gets the value for the question mark. So that's where it knows what pizza you want the toppings for. Notice it says selected value. Remember what I talked about the drop-down list? I said there's two things. There's what is displayed, and then there's the value that's behind the scenes. It's going to be used for the script. Well, the selected value is the behind the scenes value for the item that you selected in the drop-down. So that's exactly what we want to pop in the select statement so that we can pull the value for that particular pizza. Alright, click next. I can test this query. Always test your queries, right? Because you could be wrestling with all kinds of things, and um, if you uh, have a small mistake, if you call a column a wrong thing or something, now's the time you want to find it. So, because there's no drop down here, we have to give the value for our parameter. Well, let's say especially pizza 1. There's an error executing the command. All right? Please check the syntax of the command, and if present, the types and values of the parameters ensure that they are correct. So, what I did is I probably got one of these column names wrong. So let's go back to my SQL statement. Let's open up Access again. And let's look. I was going to make some errors on purpose, like later on in the lecture, but I don't have to because I made one accidentally. Okay. If I was smart, I would have claimed I did that now. I made the error on purpose, but no one would believe me. So let's look at toppings. Toppings has a column called toppings ID, topping name, description, and calories. <coughs> All right. Is it case sensitive? It is not case sensitive. Okay, okay then. All right. And the table is called toppings. Toppings ID. Especially pizza ID. <coughs> topping name. Especially pizza topping. Oh, I kind of screwed up here. Should be topping? Yeah. In yeah, this table, be. I called the topping ID, topping ID. In the toppings table, it's called toppings ID. Um, I sort of screwed up. I sort of, you should be consistent. In other words, I called the table toppings and then some of the things I called toppings, some of the things I called topping. All right. So I should have called them all toppings or, should, or called them all topping is the bottom line. But to fix this error specifically, I'm going to go into this table. It's open in the tab there. There we go. And I'm going to modify it. 
to call that column toppings. All right, so now I should no longer get the error. The reason I did that is it's important in my mind to call the same thing key-wise the same thing. So if the primary key is this, I'm going to call the foreign key the exact same thing. So I could have changed the SQL statement, but in this particular case, I thought it was better to change the column in the database table. So now I can try the test again. All right, let's try this. Type in one, and there we go. And it pulled up whatever one is, I think the Hawaiian pizza. It pulled up the toppings for that pizza. So I'm going to hit finish. There's one more thing I have to do. Any ideas what that is? Mm -hmm. Pardon me? Hide the topping ID. Hide the topping ID from where? <coughs> from the uh, grid view. Okay. Do you see a topping ID for grid view? Mm, no, but it's in the SQL statement. Okay. What you're saying is correct. We're just like not quite there yet. All right. What do you see as the columns in the, the grid view? Column 0, column 1, column 2. Hmm. Is that the columns that I'm picking up in the select statement? No. What's wrong? Titles have to match their searches. Okay. That's not completely true. What I have not done is I have not bound that data grid, that grid view, to the data source. Remember, you got two components here. You have the data and you have the way it's being displayed. In the first case, the first thing on the page, we have a data called SQL Data Source 1, and the way it's being displayed is in a drop down. So when we declare the drop down, we had to say that we wanted SQL Data Source 1. Now, for the grid view, we need the same thing. We need to say that I want SQL Data Source toppings. And now all those things match. And now we can go in, edit columns, and we can hide the ID. And we can even give better names, all right? To make our grid view look correct. All right. So drum roll, please. If I run this, oh, notice what happened. Hawaiian pizza, and this is populated correctly. I go and change this. Ah, what happened? No button. No button. Why no button? Because I crashed last time and I didn't remember to put the button back in. All right. So let's go put the button back in. Because remember, it was an auto post back, so it did go back to the server. All the database stuff happens. All the database stuff happens on the server. So therefore, it doesn't run until you hit the server. It doesn't hit the server until you submitted it. You'll submit it either if it's auto post back or if there's a button. So I can now pick veggie pizza and hit go, and it will show us that. Wow. What does that mean? Uh, I, haven't I haven't defined any toppings for the Supreme Pizza. No. And meat lovers, there we go. One thing I will do if I'm debugging a query is I will copy and paste the query into Access and run it. All right, that's something that, that is useful. In fact, let's go and do that. Yes. So 
So how would I do that? I would go and say create query design. I can go to SQL view. And then I could paste the query in. And then you click this little guy to run it. Because there's a parameter, it displays a question mark. And there you go. And then I can go back to SQL view and do the changes. All right, I promised I would show you what would happen if I forgot to join the tables together. So I'm going to eliminate this. So I eliminated this. So I have no code that joins those two things together. All right. If I do that and run it, put in my parameter, notice what I get. I get a lot more data than I would think. And I get duplicate data. And I get data that is irrelevant. There's no basil on a Hawaiian pizza. Yet basil's in there twice. There's no ham, well there is ham, but it shows ham twice. There's no mushrooms, and so on and so forth. It shows me those things multiple times. And it shows me duplicated stuff. If ever you see extra stuff in your query, like a lot of extra, there's only supposed to be two rows here, and there's actually 12, then maybe you forgot to join two tables together. Maybe there should be something in the where clause that links two tables together. And so if there's two tables, there should be something in the where clause that links two tables together. If there's three tables, then there should be something that links table A to table B, table B to table C. If there's four tables, A to B, B to C, C to D. So it's like a chain. So for every multiple tables, you probably need at least the number of tables minus one things in your where clause to link them together. So two tables, I need at least one thing in the where clause to link those two things together. And that's this. So I can go back here, go back to SQL view, run it, and I get what I want. The reason I go into access for some of these is if I get a column name wrong, Like if I spelled something wrong and I try to run it, interesting. It's actually right there. Yeah, it showed me that column name as a parameter. That's a tip off that there's something wrong. If it thinks it's a parameter, it doesn't recognize it as a column name. And if it's asking you to enter a value, then you probably spelled it wrong. So that should be toppings ID. Questions over any of this? Okay, I'd like to set up what we're going to do next time. Give some introduction to it. We're going to do a similar thing, but our user interface is going to be a little different. We're going to show specialty pizzas, and we're going to show their ingredients. All right, but we're going to do it in a different manner.
Okay. We're not going to use a drop down. This is what we're going to do instead. Okay. And I, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to think what we need. All right? This is one of those things that, like I said, when, whenever you are, you're faced with a new problem, it, it helps to take inventory of what you know or what at least you've seen before and what the new stuff is. So, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do this on two pages. The first one is going to be a list of all the specialty pizzas. second page, the second page is going to say what kind of specialty pizza it is. Maybe we'll even have a picture of the pizza. Yeah, picture is good. Alright. And then it will show a list of the toppings. All right. So let's hmm. let's think about this for a minute. Let's take inventory. Right. This page. Do what parts of this page do we know what we would do? Well, we have a grid view. You know how to make grid views. We All do. Right. We're going to have a SQL data source. Is this going to be a parameterized query or not a parameterized query? Not because they have, you're going to have to provide all of them. Exactly. There's no parameters here because we want to show all of the specialty pizzas on this page. So this one's, this one's very similar to the first thing that we did. <coughs> In fact, this may actually be the first thing that we did. All right? I don't know. The first thing we did was with topics. So this is almost the same as the first thing we did, with one exception. This guy has to be a link. So we don't know how to make a column a link yet. All right? So that will be one of the things that we'll look at next time, how to make them a link. Now, is there going to be one page for each specialty pizza so, is there going to be a page for Hawaiian pizza, a page for beet lovers pizza, a page for veggie pizza, or is there going to be one page that handles all specialty pizzas? The second one. The second one. There's the second going to be one. one page that handles all the specialty pizzas, right? That's the whole beauty of dynamic web pages, database driven web pages. Does Google have a separate page for everything you could query? Of course not. There's one page that pulls data from their databases and assembles a page. So this is going to be, let's say this page is called list. This page is called details. So there's going to be one details page. So this link is going to be a link to details.aspx. Now, do we know how to do this? Yeah, for the most part. We just did that. All right? What's the difference between what we did here and what we did, what we're going to do with this? The difference is there's no drop-down. 
So the ID is going to come from somewhere else. Other than that, this scenario is exactly what we just did. We had a grid view that got populated from a parameterized query, pulled up all the toppings for a specialty pizza, given the specialty pizza ID. The only difference is the ID is coming from somewhere else, because we don't have a drop down anywhere in here. All right? What about this? Well, we haven't really done that, but we've done something like this. We have. Remember, details views and grid views are very similar. The difference being that a detail view shows one thing at a time, whereas a, a grid view shows multiple things. So, this is probably going to be a details view. Right. Let me draw it more accurately. This is going to be a details view. How many SQL data sources are we going to have on this page? One or two? Let's describe them in words. How would you describe the data that's going to be in this details view? It will be the name and picture of the specialty pizza that we clicked on on this page. So yeah. name and picture of specialty pizza that we clicked on on this page. What would you describe this as? Yeah, the toppings of the specialty pizza that we clicked on on the other page. Is that the same thing? No. No, it's not. So we're going to have two data sources. So we talk about this data source, we're going to have this data source. And this data source is going to pull the specialty pizza data for the selected pizza. So is that going to be the parameterized query? Yeah, because we don't know which, you know, it's not going to be the same every time. It's going to be different depending on what pizza that we selected. How do we display a picture in a details view or grid view? Well, I don't know. We haven't covered that yet. We haven't covered that yet, just like we haven't covered this yet. All right? So we'll cover that. All right? The last thing, the big unknown in this, is how we get, how we tell this page what pizza we clicked on. Any thoughts on that? How can we pass from page 1 to page 2, given that page 1 is called list.aspx, this one's always going to be called details.aspx. Of course. So how are we going to tell that second page which pizza we want? That's our third mystery. We just tell the specialty pizza ID. We will. We have to tell the specialty pizza ID, but how do we tell it? What's the mechanism that we're going to convey it? How can we pass data from one page to another, in other words? Uh, Well, we'll find out next episode of CISS, yeah, of CISS 243. Yeah. So really, we got three mysteries here. We'll pick up on those on Thursday. Of course. <laughs> I would be honored to be compared to Matlock. Or we could do Columbo. I could, I'd just about be ready to go, but like... Oh, yeah. One more thing. How do we get that data? <laughs> Dirty Harry? Okay, punks, how are we going to get that data? <laughs> oh, God, I wish I would have...